Hello, this is Abule, and I hope you're in the very best of spirits today. Thank you for your support. Thank you for subscribing to the channel. Please hit the notification bell so you know when new videos are uploaded. Thank you for your thumbs up, for your comments, and thank you for sharing the videos. Thank you for all you do to support the channel. If you'd like to have a topic discussed, let me know in the comments section or email me at ladyboulet8596 at aol.com. The discussion today is going to be a blast from the past. It's probably something that many of us are not familiar with, but it's something that's very important. And the topic is how a Quaker woman and a Jewish man educated a nation of black children. Today's African American children take education for granted. In many cases, they attend state-of-the-art schools with certified and highly qualified teachers. They have two and sometimes three meals a day at the school. They have a bus to pick them up in the morning and deliver them in the afternoon if parents can't provide transportation. And they learn in attractive, comfortable classrooms that are cool in the summer and warm in the winter. But there was a time in America when this wasn't so. There was a time. When the education of black children was not a priority in America. And they were not guaranteed even a basic education. And I'm saying they, but I mean we, because I would have been included in that too. During slavery from 1619 to 1865, it was against the law for enslaved people to learn how to read and write. After slavery, it wasn't against the law, but there was no foundation for them to learn. A few slaves had learned to read against the law and there were the preachers and a few others who had learned how to read and they were trying to teach the others when they could barely read and write themselves. So millions came out of slavery ignorant of the basics of reading and writing. Now we know they were smart. Many of them were very smart, but they did not have formal training in reading and writing. So there was a nation of black people unable to read and write with no means of learning how. There was no commitment on the part of the state or the local school boards to provide any means for educating black children. Now the reason was because they had already instituted a new form of slavery called Jim Crow and they needed black people still working on those farms sharecropping to keep the economy going and to keep money in their pockets. From the late 19th century to the early 20th century, about 90% of African Americans lived in the South. And of the ones living in the South, 75% of them were living on those farms, sharecropping in most cases. The best chance for an African American child to get an education at this time was to move to a large city and urban area, but there was still no guarantee those schools were very few and far between. So something else had to be done if black children were going to receive an education. And this is where Booker T. Washington, we're talking about Booker T. Washington again. Booker T. Washington, fate whom we sometimes call God, and human decency came together. Booker T. Washington was an educator and activist. He doesn't get credit for being an activist, but he absolutely was. He was the founder of Tuskegee Institute. During his time building and building up Tuskegee Institute, he had made acquaintances with many wealthy northerners, and they admired the work he was doing at Tuskegee and donated generously to him. Booker T. Washington in his time was the most influential African American in the United States. It was not because he was running his mouth all the time. It was because he was doing things. And again, people admired what he was doing because they weren't crazy. They know what had happened to, those people knew what had happened to black people. They knew how we had been used by the system. They knew what a terrible condition we were in. So many people really did want to help. Booker T. Washington was the conduit for making things happen. They trusted him because he had proven himself trustworthy. 
and he cared about his people. You couldn't do what Booker T. Washington did and not care about your people. Because he could have done like a lot of other people. He could have gotten his education and gone off and made a great life for himself. But he did not. He dedicated his life to his work at Tuskegee. In response to Booker T. Washington's plea for help in educating these young people, the Northern philanthropists began donating money to the fund. They needed to train teachers, teachers needed to be paid, and they needed facilities in some cases. In some cases, they had built churches. They came out of the slavery system building churches. So in the places where they had churches, the churches could be used as schools during the week. But there were some areas where they didn't even have a church. So they needed buildings for the children to attend. So money had to be allocated for buildings in the areas where they didn't even have a church yet. In 1907, Anna T. Jeans, a Philadelphia Quaker woman, donated $1 million to Booker T. Washington for elementary education for black children in the South. She actually gave him a $1 million check in hand. That is what is reported. This is possibly the most important seed money that has ever gone toward the education of a race of people. This money funded many schools in the rural South in these poor communities during a time when black people really, really needed their education. And to that end, they hired well-trained supervising instructors. The first one, Virginia Estet Randolph, was hired in 1908. She taught academics, but her focus was on cooking, sewing, woodworking, and other vocational subjects, skills that they could use to earn a living. This woman, Ms. Virginia Esther Randolph, was a success by any measure because she served in this capacity for almost 60 years, from 1908 until the mid-60s. By then, the black schools were being funded by state and local boards, and they were integrated. I cannot stress enough the impact that these jeans teachers had on the education of black people in the South. And let's remember that in 1907, 90% of African Americans lived in the South, most of them in rural areas. The Jeans teachers educated a nation of black children. My own parents' teachers were Jeans trained and supervised. My mother especially remembered how strict they were, but how effective and skillful they were at classroom management and delivering instruction. So I hope Anna T. James is resting well because she did a great service to the African American people at a time when that service was desperately needed. A little bit about Anna T. James. First of all, this was an on-time Quaker woman. She not only talked the talk, she walked the walk. Quakers were opposed to slavery. And many of the abolitionists, those who fought against slavery, including operating the Underground Railroad, many of them were Quakers. Anna T. Jeans was the youngest of ten children, and this is very important. Her family's wealth came from coal and mineral mines, not slavery. Her family did not gain their wealth from the slave system. None of her siblings married, and neither did she but she was the sole inheritor of her family's wealth. So she was, in, she was left a great deal of money, millions. She used her wealth for the betterment of mankind. Because of her experience with cancer, and, did she, and she did have cancer towards the end of her life, she left a generous endowment to the Cancer Research an American Oncologic Hospital. That hospital eventually became Fox Chase Cancer Center a member of the Temple University Health System in Philadelphia. She also provided funds for an asylum for widows and single women and homes for destitute colored children. She also left money for homes for the aged and infirmed colored persons. These are other charities that she supported. The Pennsylvania Industrial Home for Blind Men, Pennsylvania Society to Prevent Cruelty to Children, Sanitarium Association for Sick Children, Soup Kitchens, and Children's Nurseries. 
So she spread her money around to help as many people as she could. It must be noted again that this family's wealth did not come from the exploitation of black people or slave labor. Julius Rosenwald was another philanthropist that Booker T. Washington was able to enlist in assisting in educating these young people. Julius Rosenwald was born to a Jewish-German immigrant family and became wealthy in the clothing industry. He was a supplier for Sears Roebuck, which was a mail-order business at this time. He became an investor in the company, eventually becoming the president. In 1912, Booker T. Washington asked Julius Rosenwald to serve on the board of Tuskegee Institute, and he did become a member of that board. And he endowed Tuskegee with so much money that Booker T. Washington was able to spend less time traveling, going up north, asking rich philanthropists for money, and devote more time toward the management of Tuskegee. Not surprisingly, Booker T. Washington urged him to donate funds for the education of black children in rural Alabama. The building of these schools began in 1913. This project, in fact, built more than 5,000 schools, shops, and teacher homes in the United States, primarily for the education of African American children. Now, they started in Alabama, but this project reached from Texas all the way up to Maryland. It was an extensive building project. And those schools, some of those schools are now on the National Register of Historic Places. Like Anna T. Jeans, Julius Rosenwald provided the seed money, but his money came with strings attached. He required local black communities to raise matching funds and to provide labor. Booker T. Washington was very involved in this project. Tuskegee Institute students provided labor, their architects designed the school buildings, and they made the bricks and blocks by hand for the schools. Julius Rosenwald required white school boards to contribute to the project when one of his schools was built in their district. And I'm proud to report that African American communities throughout the South did their part. Through the Rosenwald Fund, millions of dollars were raised by African Americans in rural communities to educate their children. So black people can really raise money when they want to. White boards did agree to operate and maintain the schools, but I'm going to interject here that they did not do a good job. There was no incentive from the white communities in the South to aid or assist in the education of black children because they needed those children, especially those boys, in the fields working, picking cotton picking sugarcane or whatever they do with sugarcane, doing what they had to do to stabilize the southern economy. So they did not help. And, you know, we understand why, but the point is they didn't help. In closing, I will say Anna T. Jeans has a clean record as far as I'm concerned. She was a Quaker woman. Her family built their wealth on coal and mineral mines and not black people not slave labor. So good for Ms. Anna T. Jeans, who is a wonderful example of a proper Quaker woman. Julius Rosenwald's resume is more delicate, and I'll tell you why. The company that we know as Sears began in 1892 as Sears and Roebuck with Richard Warren Sears and Alva Curtis Roebuck. The word out, or the word that has come down to black people, is that Alva Curtis Roebuck was black. If you Google Alva Curtis Roebuck, you're going to see pictures of black and white men. So I'm just going to put some on the screen. Black publications will show him as a black man, and then white publications will show him as white. But it has been widely talked about and discussed that Roebuck was black. Whatever happened, in 1895, he was bought out or forced out for twenty dollars or $25,000. Julius Rosenwald became partners with Richard 
Warren Sears and eventually became president of the company. He was also friends with Paul Sachs of Goldman Sachs. And we will recall that Goldman Sachs started out as a slave trading bank in the South. We have to bring these things out, not to indict anybody, but we have to bring these things out. So seeing what's happening to Sears now, it doesn't surprise me. But to his credit, Mr. Rosenwald may have benefited from slavery and or black people, but at least he gave something back. That's the most that I can say. Those schools were very important to the education of black children during that time. So what we have here is two unlikely people who played a large part in African American history by providing funds, buildings, and trained professionals to educate poor black children in the rural South. During this Thanksgiving season, it is my pleasure to present these two individuals. We can critique people, you know, these many years later, but it was really important for as many African Americans to learn how to read and write as possible. And those schools educated over half a million black students. And those half a million educated more. So they honestly did educate a nation of black people. As a child growing up in the South, there were people that would come to my mother for her to read letters and documents and things and, and respond back because there were still many people who could not read and write. But because of these schools, there were people in the community that could help. That was a very important part of growing up in the South, helping each other. I'm going to leave you with pictures of some of those early rural schools that are now on the National Register of historic places. The significance of that is that the government provides funds for the maintenance and upkeep of those schools. Thank you for listening. Subscribe, give me a thumbs up, leave a comment, share the video, and as always, have a great day.